Chapter 15 A Bird for Discovering One's Soul The next day we went to the glade, and, as before, watched from a concealed vantage point as our little son was engrossed in his play. The wolf lay at the edge of the glade, following everything with a keen eye. Her cubs played by her side. I noticed little Vladimir from time to time sticking his fingers in his mouth and sucking on it, as all children that age do, for some reason. I knew parents are supposed to dissuade their offspring from this habit by some means or other, either by binding the child's hands with cloth or by giving him a soother. I mentioned this to Anastasia, and she replied, Not to worry, this is extremely beneficial. Our son is licking pollen from his fingers. Pollen? What kind of pollen? Pollen from the flowers and the grass. He touches the flowers and grass with his hands. Sometimes bugs will crawl across his hand, and they carry pollen, too, on their legs. See, he's frowning and taking his finger out of his mouth. That means he did not like the taste of some kind of grass pollen. Now he's bending down and trying to put a flower into his mouth to see how it tastes. Let him do that. Let him taste the universe. The universe and a little flower? What's the connection? Or is it simply a figure of speech? Everything alive in the world has a connection with the universe. But how? Where? Where can one see this connection? What instrument is capable of measuring it? One does not need an instrument. One only needs one's soul. Then you will be able to see and understand what is visible around us every day, many times over. What can be seen and then understood with the soul? Give me an example. Take the sun, for instance. It is far away from us, a planet of the universe. Yet as soon as it rises, it touches a flower with its ray, and the flower opens in delight. It seems as though they are so far apart from each other, the great, huge orb of day and the tiny wee flower, but they are linked together. One cannot exist without the other. Anastasia unexpectedly fell silent and began looking up. I looked up, too. I saw a large eagle circling over the glade. I had seen eagles something like that at the zoo. It kept circling lower and lower, and all at once it touched down with its talons about two meters from the boy. The inertia of its flight kept it moving along the ground for a while. Then, after shaking its feathers all over, it stood forth proud in the glade. The wolf pricked up her ears. Her fur was standing on end, but she made no move to attack the eagle, which was now strutting proudly across the glade. The little one got all excited. He sat down on his little bare bottom and, without any awareness of danger, stretched out his hands toward the fearsome bird. Strutting slowly on its talons, the eagle came right up close to the boy. Its hooked beak hung right over his little head. The boy apparently felt himself in no danger whatsoever. He began to feel the eagle's feathers and touched its talon-tip legs. He clapped his little hands against the eagle's chest and smiled. All at once, its huge beak touched the boy's head, then a second time as if looking for something on it. Then the eagle went off to one side and spread its wings. With a beat of its wings, it rose slightly off the ground and again touched down and stood still. The boy stretched out his arms in the direction of the huge, threatening bird and began uttering sounds. Eh, eh. And all at once, the eagle, the eagle went behind the boy's back and all of a sudden started running and then took it, then it took flight. It circled low over the glade, dived down and without landing, picked up the boy in its enormous talons. But the talons did not pierce his flesh. The eagle thrust its sharp claws under the boy's armpits and began circling low over the glade, beating its wings and trying to lift the little one off the ground. The boy jerked his trailing feet along the grass, sometimes ever so slightly lifting them into the air. The boy's eyes were bulging, sparkling with the fire of excitement, and then, all at once, they rose into the air. They had risen a meter above the ground when they achieved synchronicity. When the push of the little feet against the ground coincided with the beat of the eagle's wings, the eagle kept circling, lifting the two of them gradually higher, but the boy didn't cry out. They simply flew, rising together into the deep blue. By this time, the eagle had lifted the boy above the tops of the tall cedars and was continuing to climb. Overcome with shock and still speechless, I seized Anastasia's arm. Her eyes remained fixed on the sky as she whispered to herself, 
You are still the strong one. Bravo! And you may indeed be old, but you are still strong. Your wings are still mighty. Fly, fly even higher. And the eagle, bearing in its talons, the wee child's little body kept circling and climbing higher and higher into the heavenly blue. What's the point of subjecting the child to an ex execution like this? Why expose him to such danger? I yelled at Anastasia as soon as I had recovered from shock. Please do not worry, Vladimir. The eagle's ascent is not nearly as dangerous as the airplanes on which you yourself have flown. But what if he drops the boy from way up there? He would never even think of such a thing. You just relax, and do not either fear or doubt into your thoughts. The eagle's flight is making an extremely significant contribution to our son's conscious awareness. Note that the eagle has lifted the child above our earth. What significance can be here? Can there be here? I countered. Except for superstition, it is quite true that man should not interfere in great works of creation. With that I agree. But an ascent like this was not provided for by the Creator. You yourself, along with your grandfather, taught the bird to do this. Out of some kind of superstition, most likely. What else could it be? There's no point in taking such a risk. When I was little, came Anastasia's reply, I too flew up high with this same eagle. I did not have a great deal of understanding back then, but it was so interesting, so extraordinary. The glade seemed so small from up high and the earth seemed so broad and unfathomable. Everything was so bright, and this extraordinary experience stayed with me for a long time, forever. When I had grown some by this time, I was three years old. Great-grandfather asked me a question. Tell me, Anastasia, do all the creatures like it when you stroke and caress them with your hand? Yes, they all do. They keep wagging their tails to show how much they like my caressing. The grass and the flowers and the trees like it too, but not all of them have tails to wag to show how good it feels to be stroked. So everything desires to feel the embrace of your hand? Yes, everything living and growing, small or large. And the wide earth also wants to be caressed? You have seen the earth. How wide is it? At this point, I recalled the vivid experience I had had with the eagle as a baby. The size of the earth was was not something I knew just from hearsay, and so I answered great-grandfather without hesitating. The earth is wide, you cannot see its edge, but if everyone wants to be caressed, that means the earth must want it, too. But who would be able to embrace the whole earth? It is so great that even your arms, great-grandfather, would not be able to embrace the whole earth. Great-grandfather stretched out his arms to either side, looked at them, and nodded in agreement. You are right, even my arms are not long enough to embrace the whole earth. But you said that the earth, like everyone else, wishes to be caressed. Yes, it does. Everybody wants to be caressed by man. So you, Anastasia, should embrace the whole earth as well. Think about how you could do this, great-grandfather said, and walked away. I began thinking a, thinking a lot of the time about how to embrace the whole earth. And I could not think of anything. And I knew that great-grandfather would not speak to me. He would not ask me any more questions until I had solved this problem. And so I kept trying. More than a month passed, and the problem had not been solved. And then, one day, I found myself looking tenderly at the wolf from a distance. She was standing on the other side of the glade. All at once, sensing my gaze, the wolf started wagging her tail. Then I began to notice how all the creatures were so delighted when I looked at them with joy and tenderness. How big they were or how far away they were was not important. They were delighted just from my looking at them or thinking about them with love. I realized that they were just as happy as they had been earlier when I was stroking them with my hand. Then I became aware of something. Here was I with my hands and feet, and yet there was also this other me larger than could be shown by someone else, someone's hands. And this larger, invisible entity was also me. That meant that every man was set up just like me, and this larger me was indeed capable of embracing the whole earth. When great-grandfather showed up, I was all bubbling with joy, and I said to him, Look, Grandpakin, see how happy all the creatures are? Not just when I touch them with my hand, but also when I look upon them from a distance. It is invisible, but something of me is embracing them, and it can embrace the whole earth too. 
I shall embrace the earth with my invisible self. I am Anastasia. There is the little me, and there is the greater me. But how is this other me called? I do not know yet. But I shall think about how to call it properly, and I shall say its name and give you the whole answer, Grandpakins. Then will you begin talking with me again? The great-grandfather began talking with me right away and said, Call your second self, dear granddaughter, soul, your soul, and cherish it and act in accord with this limitless soul of yours. Tell me, Vladimir, Anastasia said, addressing me, how old were you when you first became aware of your soul, when you felt it for the first time? I don't remember exactly, I replied, and wondered whether I had ever really discovered my soul, or whether others discovered it too, and at what age, and to what degree. Maybe we simply talk about our soul, not really feeling at one with it, not really thinking about our, sec thinking about our second invisible self. And how important it is it to feel all that? And what for? The tiny dot moving overhead quickly began enlarging. The eagle kept circling lower and lower over the glade. When it reached the height of the treetops, I could see the little one's flushed face and his eyes sparkling with excitement. The little fingers at the tips of his outstretched arms were moving in time with the wing beats of the extraordinary bird. When the little one's legs touched the ground and started trailing across the glade, the eagle loosened its talons. The little one fell, rolled over in the grass, and quickly got up on all fours. Then he sat up and started turning his head around, looking for his newfound friend. The eagle staggered off a little ways, but then fell on its side. It lay awkwardly on the grass about ten meters distant, with one wing sticking out at an angle. It was having a hard time breathing, and its head was resting on the ground. The little one saw it, broke into a smile, and crawled over to it. The eagle attempted to get up and greet the boy, but once again rolled over on its side. Maliciously baring her teeth, the wolf took two leaps and landed between the eagle and the boy. Anastasia whispered, her voice trembling. How perfect and strict are your laws. You gave everything to man right from the beginning, creator. The wolf is following your laws, but I feel sorry, very sorry for the eagle. What is going on? Why is the wolf acting so aggressive and malicious? I asked Anastasia. Now the wolf will not let the eagle come to Vladimir, she replied. She thinks it has fallen ill, since it has rolled over on its side. She could not. She could attack it to chase it out of the glade. Vladimir must not see the attack. He will not understand it at the present time. Oh, what to do? What can we possibly do? At this point, the eagle shook its feathers, got up firmly on its feet, proudly threw back its head, and clicked its fearsome beak twice. With proud and sure step, the eagle began strutting toward the boy. The wolf appeared to calm down, <clears throat> went off to one side, but not far. She was ready at any moment to make her leap and followed the proceedings like a hawk. The little one first touched the enormous bird's beak, then began tugging on its wing feathers, ruffling them and demanding or, or asking something, repeating all the while, Eh! Ah! The bird's hooked beak touched the crown of the boy's head, along with his shoulders, which still bore the mark of the eagle's talons. Then the eagle bent its head to the ground, and using its beak to tear off a little flower, put it in the boy's open mouth, as though it were feeding its young. The little one, all the while, kept making the same vowel sounds. After performing this parental duty, the eagle began staggering again. The malicious wolf crouched for a leap, and then suddenly the eagle, it started into a run. There was a beating of wings and take off. Time after time, it would rise higher and higher, then make a sudden dive for the glade. About a meter and a half away from the ground, it would level out and ascend once more. The little one waved at it, stretched his arms out to it, called it, laughing with a toothless grin. Anastasia kept her eyes fixed on the eagle and whispered with concern. You do not have to do that. You did everything just right. And you are healthy. I know you are not sick. Relax, my dear eagle, relax. Thank you. I believe. I believe you are well. You are just a little old. Relax. Once again, the eagle executed its complex pirouette in such a way as to touch the grass with its talons. Still, it did not land or push off from the ground. Instead, with a powerful thrust of its wings, it managed to rise in the air, snatching a clump of grass along the way. It circled, showered the little one with the grass, and began rising higher and higher into the sky. 
As before, Anastasia followed the eagle like a hawk, not taking her eyes away even when it became nothing but a dot in the blue. For some reason, I found myself following it too as the dot grew ever more distant from the glade. At first, it went straight up and then veered sharply off to the side, away from the glade. Suddenly, the dot headed for the ground and it wasn't long before we could see that first one wing and then the other one spreading themselves but simply from the wind and not as a deliberate action by the bird. It was not flapping its wings or soaring, it was simply falling. Its wings were ruffling in the wind, it was the wind that had opened them. Anastasia exclaimed, You died in the sky way up high, and there you remain. You did all that you could possibly do for man. Thank you, thank you for showing us your heights, my old teacher. The eagle continued to fall while two young eagles circled overhead. Those are your offspring. They are strong already. You did everything for their future too, whispered Anastasia to the old eagle which had fallen somewhere beyond the glade, as though in death it could still hear her. By this time the two young eagles were circling low over the glade. I knew they were its offspring and the little one waved to them. Of all things, I exclaimed to Anastasia, why this sen senseless sacrifice? Why did he? What did he do that for? And do it all for man? Why do they try like that, Anastasia? Why do they sacrifice themselves like that? For the light emanating from man, for the grace which man can give them, and for a feeling of hope for their offspring. Now its offspring will see and sense the light of, of life-giving love from man. Look, Vladimir, our son smiled at the young eagles, and now they are flying over to him. Perhaps the old eagle has realized that this light, this grace-filled light, emanating from man will also include a particle of itself. Are they ready to sacrifice themselves for the light emanating from everyone? From everyone who is capable of emitting this grace-filled light? Chapter 16 The System Anastasia went off to get ready to feed our son, while I once again set out for a walk in the woods to do some thinking. Two things were bothering me, unpleasant things. The first was how I, as a father, was still unable to find myself a niche where I could participate in the raising of my son. It had become clear to me that I could not come up with any more interesting toys than those he, ha he had already, and there was no point in bringing food in either. Our son has his mother's milk and fresh flower pollen, and then there will be nuts and berries. Naturally, packaged baby food is no substitute for a living, growing source of nourishment. Yet still, I had a hard time mentally accepting this kind of situation. After all, Anastasia has nothing, and yet the same time she lacks nothing, and can even make liberal provisions for the baby. In the TV adverts, there is such a hype about toys and other stuff for children that it almost seems a child won't survive without them. Here, however, they make no sense at all. More than that, they are actually harmful. A baby doesn't even need a crib here. With a crib like the one he has, namely the bear, of course, he is not going to freeze even when the temperature is minus 40. There is no need to wash sheets or diapers. The bear, can you believe it, is also a stickler for cleanliness. Each time she scrapes clean her groin area with her claws, just like a comb. She rubs her tummy on the grass and then bathes. When she comes out of the water, she shakes herself off with a spray flying in all directions, then lies down on her back with her tummy up and dries herself off, and then once again combs her groin area. Anastasia took me over to her and had me feel the place where our little one sleeps. It is soft there, clean and warm. But even if I am not required to make any kind of material provision, a father should still take part in raising his son. That's for certain. Only how? Maybe I should go to Anastasia and firmly demand a definitive answer. After all, I have fulfilled all her conditions. I have not picked up the baby, nor, ha nor have I insisted on making him use the presents I brought with me. My other disappointment was in not being able to fill, fulfill my readers' requests and lay out a specific system or timetable for raising children. There are a lot of questions in the letters about children and they are always asked at readers' conferences. I promised that I would definitely question Anastasia about this and in my next book I would set forth a system her family has used from generation to generation to bring up their young. 
And there you have it. Not only does she reject systems in general, but she even declares any system to be harmful. Of course, that cannot be. Amidst all the harmful systems, there has to be at least one that is right. And then it dawned on me. In all the reader's letters, there was not a single question about child raising addressed to me. Everyone was looking at, to Anastasia for an answer. And if people actually trust her more than the usual experts in our world, certainly more than they trust me, and then it's up to her to answer the questions raised. She's the one who is obliged to do that. My part is simply to lay it out on paper. I've got enough on my plate just putting out the books. Anastasia finished her tasks and came running over in all her rosy-cheeked cheerfulness. Everything are, is done. Our son is asleep. You have not been too bored here all by, her, all by yourself. I've been thinking. About what? About how there was nothing more to write in my next book. I told you how the people are waiting for answers to their specific questions. People are interested in child raising. But what can I write about that? Sure, I'll tell about how you communicate with the baby, how he's getting on. But what's the point? In the conditions of our world, that kind of regime is simply not practicable. Nobody is going to train a bear or a wolf or an eagle, and nobody has a glade with pure pollen on the flowers as you have here. But it is not the bear that is important, Vladimir, nor the eagle. They are merely effects. There is just one thing that is important, and it will find the right path under any conditions. And what's that? One's attitude to one's child. The thoughts surrounding the child, believe me and try to understand. Christ could be born only by a mother who believed that Christ would be born to her. And if the parents have the same attitude to their child as they would to Christ or Muhammad, their offspring will follow this thought, and he will become whoever he aspires to become. People will still explore nature, and those who are able to feel and become aware of what the Creator has created, its sense and purpose, they will be able to make a bright and happy world for their child. But how do they feel this? There has to be somehow a gradual process. There has to be a procedure. This can be felt only with the heart. Only the heart is capable of understanding it. And more specifically? You wrote more specifically when you told about the Dachniks, yet you took no notice of yourself. What is the point of wasting more words? If the heart and the soul are not open, the words will simply vanish with the wind, barely noticeable. Yes, I did write a few words about that, but nothing has come of them in real life. Young shoots are barely noticeable. They are not seen by everyone right off. All the more so in the case of young shoots growing in the soil. But if you can't see them, what's the point in writing? I write, I, write, I try, but still there are many who do, not, who do not believe or understand what you are talking about. And there are some who even doubt your existence. Think about it, Vladimir. Perhaps you will be able to see some logic even in their doubts. What kind of logic can there be in their doubts? Doubts make counteractions less likely, and that is why I exist for those for whom I exist. They and I coexist together side by side in each other's hearts. If you think about it a bit longer, it will make sense to you. I exist because of them. They have the power to engender, to create, and not to destroy. They will understand you and support you and will be mentally by your side. You can say what you like, but I'm tired of listening to insulting remarks. Dispel the doubts of the unbelievers. Come and show yourself on television. Show something of your extraordinary abilities. I implored Anastasia, and she replied, Believe me, Vladimir, my appearance in the flesh and any miracles performed in public will not pour the light of faith into the faithless. They will only exacerbate the feeling of irritation on the part of those who do not like someone else's perception of the world. And you should not waste your energies on them. To everything there is a season, to everything there is a dawn. And if you wish, I shall come forth to people, and I shall appear in the flesh. But before that, I must make it so women who have involuntary, involuntarily consecrated their lives to the kitchen can experience joys of a different order. And so that the light of love may shine upon young mothers who have been left alone with their children. And the children, you see, the children, their souls must be liberated from the tyranny of theories. 
See, there you go again with your dream. A lot of time has gone by since you started to dream that way, but little has actually been done. We've got a book, there's pictures and poetry, but where are your global achievements for all people? Only don't talk of bright little shoots growing in people's souls. Show something tangible, something that can be felt in real life. You can't show anything, can you? I can. Then show it. If I show it, I shall be subjecting you to the temptation to open prematurely the little shoots which are just starting to come up. And then who will protect them from a damaging hailstorm? You will. In that case, I shall be obliged to do so, to correct my mistake. Look, at that point, thanks to Anastasia, I was able to witness a phenomenon which was even more extraordinary and overwhelming than anything I had described in my books to date. Within the space of a single moment, either inside me or in front of me, I'm not sure which, there paraded a multitude of marvelous faces of people of different ages and from different parts of the earth. This was not just any series of flickering images, not just people's faces, but their splendid actions, too, be appeared before my eyes. I could see the circumstances surrounding them, the events that were happening to them or because of them, all over their whole lifetime. They were all drawn from our present reality. It would have taken many years to view such a quantity of information on, the, on a cinema screen, yet here it took but a single moment after which Anastasia was standing once more before me in exactly the same position she was in before. She began speaking the moment I saw her. You were thinking, Vladimir, that what you saw was merely a kind of hypnosis. I ask you please not to try to guess the means by which these people appeared before you. We were talking about children, about the most important thing. Did you see the children? Tell me. Yes, I saw the children. Their faces looked intelligent and kind. The children were building a house all by themselves, a very beautiful house, and so big. They were singing while they worked, and I saw a gray-haired man amongst them. This man was a scholar, an academic, and he appeared to me right off to be very wise. Only he was talking in a peculiar fashion. He seemed to think that children could be wiser even than those whom we call professors. The children were talking with this academic as an equal, and yet at the same time with respect. Indeed, there was a lot about children in my vision, about how different their education was, the things they dreamt about, but that's only a vision. So what's the point in carrying on about it? In real life, things are not like that at all. What you saw was indeed real life, Vladimir, and before long you will be persuaded of that yourself. And to my amazement, it all came about, just as Anastasia promised. It happened, and I saw it. Chapter 17. Put your vision of happiness into practice. Soon after returning from the taiga, I went once again to the city of Galenzik to attend a reader's conference on the Anastasia book. The governor's aide in charge of the Glensic district of the Krasnodar region took me to see the academic Mikhail Petrovich Shetinin's forest school. A narrow gravel roll road led from the main highway into the forest to a valley nestled amidst the mountain peaks. The road soon came to an end in front of a most unusual two-story mansion. It was still under construction. From one of the still frameless window openings wafted the sounds of children's voices singing a Russian folk song. This building was part of the vision Anastasia had showed me back in the Taiga forest, but now it was an altogether real experience. Without a word to anyone, I made my way through the various construction materials to touch this mansion with my own hands. As I approached, I saw a little girl, about ten years old, climbing deftly down a ladder. She went over to a pile of river pebbles and began selecting and dropping stones into an old Harrington. When she started back up the ladder, I climbed up after her in the direction of the alluring music pouring forth from above. There on the second floor I watched as a group of kids like her, some a little older, were taking smooth pebbles out of a box and attaching them with a cement mixture to the wall, making an amazingly beautiful pattern. Two little girls at once carefully washed off each newly attached stone with damp rags. They set about their task in earnest singing as they worked. No adults were present. 
Later I found out that the whole foundation, indeed each brick of the structure, had been laid by a child's hand. The children had come up with the whole design by themselves, including every corner of their building. And this is not the only such building on the little campus. In this amazing setting, children are constructing not only their buildings, their campus, but their whole future in the process. And they sing! Here, a ten-year-old girl is capable of building a house, doing splendid drawings, and cooking meals. Not to mention knowing ballroom dance steps and mastering the fundamentals of Russian martial arts. The children of this forest school are acquainted with Anastasia. They themselves told me about her. Three hundred pupils from different Russian cities study here. At this school, children take but a year to master the whole ten-year public school math syllabus along with studying three foreign languages. They neither recruit nor produce child prodigies. They simply give the kids a chance to discover what already lies within them. Academic Mikhail Petrovich Shetinin School comes under the Russian Federation's Ministry of Education. It charges no tuition fees. Even though the school does not advertise itself, it has no vacancies. Indeed, there is already a waiting list of 2,500 hopefuls for an unexpected opening. It is hard to find words to describe the joy on these children's beaming faces. I went to visit the school directly after the readers' conference at Galenzik. I went with a small group of readers who had heard about my intended visit. One of these readers was Natalia Sergevina Bondarchuk, an actress and film director who is also on the board of the Rorik Society. A specialist in esoterics, she gave a presentation at the conference in the Rorik's legacy and on esoterics in general. She talked about Anastasia far more intelligently than I. Natalia Sergevina was accompanied by her ten-year-old daughter, Mashenka. After the conference, the two of them were to go to a film festival in Anapa, where Mash Mashenka, beloved grandmother, the famous actress Ina Makarova, was already staying. But Mashenka's words came as thunderous call to new enlightenment. Mamochka, please, just for three days, just three. While you go to the festival, arrange for me to stay here at this school. And the delicate little Mashenka stayed for three days at the school. To the great astonishment of her mother, who sadly said, Apparently, we don't give enough to our children. Even though we love them, we are inadvertently stealing from them. Natalia Sergevna was accompanied by a film cameraman. He began shooting as soon as the children of Shetanin's school started talking about their communication with Anastasia and their understanding of life. I'd like to reproduce here some of our conversations with the children who were building this mansion. Natalia Sergevna and I were the ones asking the questions. One gets the impression that each brick of your building here is filled with the bright energy of a great power. Yes, that's true, answered an older red-haired girl. So much depends on the people who touch them. We have done all this with love. We are trying with our mental attitude to bring only what is good and happy for to our future. Who designed this building? The columns and paintings? This was the result of our united collective thinking. Does that mean that while each one is outwardly working on their own individual task, in actual fact it represents a collective thought? That's right. Every evening we get together and plan out or visualize the day ahead. We come up with the images we want to see expressed in the design of our mansion. Some of the pupils here take on the role of architect. They give specific form to our common work, tie it all together. What images is expressed in the room we're standing now? The image of Svarog, the primordial element of heavenly fire. You can see him here in the symbols, in the pebble amulets. Does your group recognize one of its own as a principal or a superior? We do not have a leader, but by and large it is the collective thought that is at work here. Lava, we call it. Say that again? Thought is lava? That's right. A state of mind, an image, a desire. 
Do you all work with such great delight? Everybody's smiling, everybody such, with such sparkling eyes, everybody so cheerful? Yes, our life is like that since we are doing what we want, doing what we can, doing what we love to do. You said each stone has its own pulse and rhythm. Yes, and this pulse beats once a day, just once. It is like that with all stones, or do some beat twice a day? Every stone's pulse beats once a day. Does it seem to you that your mansion is something like a temple? A temple is not a form, but a state of mind. For example, the cupolas, they simply help you access a particular state of mind. The form is molded by feeling, and it is not by chance that the form of a cupola or hipped roof came to us. They represent our aspirations for heaven and the descent of heavenly grace. This building, where every stone is laid with a good thought, is it able to heal? Of course. And does it heal? Yes, it does. I couldn't help looking at the girls attaching the river pebble ornamental design to the wall of the upper room. The girls were dressed in very plain, unsophisticated attire. They were beautiful, only with an unusual kind of beauty. I thought to myself, where do we go to meet our future wives? To dance halls, parties, and resorts, eh? We see our future wives all made up wearing the latest fashions, luring us with their slender legs and other charms of their figure. All this is what we marry, and then later, when the makeup is rubbed off, you look, and there you see sitting before you a kikimora. And looking like a kikimora, grumbling away and demanding attention and love. What happiness is there in living your whole life with a kikimora? What is there to talk about with her? And then she demands your support. You support her financially, too. Oh, what rotten luck. But just maybe we get what we deserve. Of course we get what we deserve. You have to be a complete idiot to marry makeup and long legs. But some of us are lucky. Some of us end up marrying, well, these girls here. The ones sticking the ornamental stones on the walls. They will be able to build a beautiful house and to cook meals with love. They know all sorts of foreign languages. They're wise, smart, beautiful. And when they grow up, they'll become still more beautiful, even without cosmetics. Naturally, many will want to take them to wife, but who will they agree to marry? This was a question we put to these beautiful little girls wearing plain clothes. Tell me, who would you like to marry? What kind of husband would you like? What qualities should he have? And right away, without hesitation, the first girl responded, kindness, patience, and he should be a man who loves his motherland, a man with honor and dignity. And what is honor in your view? For me, honor can be summed up in one saying, I have the honor of being Russian. And what constitutes a Russian man? It is a man who loves his motherland, first and foremost. It is one who stands up for her and never fails her. Not for a moment, not even the most difficult moment, he feels himself a part of Russ. And your children will live for the motherland? Yes. And that means your husband must share this view as well? Yes. The second girl answered the question as follows. He should be a man capable of giving light and warmth to other people. If he radiates light and warmth, it will be good for those around him and our family too. A man rich in spirit, healthy in spirit, and this can't be compared with any other kind of riches. The littlest girl wasn't asked any, quest any questions while the camera was running, but later I put the same query to her and got the following response. Maybe all the best men will get married while I'm growing up, but my husband will still be very good, kind, and happy. I shall make him that way. I shall help him the way Anastasia does. And I saw and realized that Anastasia was sharing her abilities with these children. Why with the children of Sh Shetanin school? Because academic Mikhail Petrovich Shetanin is himself a great magician. One who has created and continues to create a big space of love. And it will continue to grow even bigger. Right now, these girls are little Anastasias with their light brown braids, but they will grow up. They will spread across the earth, creating oases like this one, until the whole earth is filled with them. As I was standing there in the upper room of the second story of this extraordinary mansion, examining the ornamental designs and drawings executed by the children's hands, though more reminiscent of the art of the old masters, 
I had the impression of being in the greatest, brightest, and most welcoming temple on earth. This was probably because the amount of bright energy in this mansion, every millimeter of which had been lovingly caressed by ch children's hands, was indefinitely greater than in many religious temples. And then I had another thought come to me. Here we will continue to go about restoring ruined churches and monasteries using modern technology and reinforced concrete construction. Not such a difficult thing to do, really. And then we'll have to come to these temples with the feeling that we have done our duty and begin asking, Lord, bless our work. But no blessings will be received, because during this time God will be concentrating His attention on the children constructing this extraordinary temple building. And He will be concerned that they will run out of cement and not have enough bricks and boards for the floor. And God will lovingly bless all those who help them. And I couldn't resist the temptation to show <coughs> the world and these little shoots. I couldn't resist doing what Anastasia was so afraid of. And this is how it happened. I was walking down the aisle between rows of kitchen tables set up outdoors for the children to work at, when I suddenly felt a soft warmth in my body as though someone was training a heat reflector on me. The sensation of warmth was similar to that emitted by Anastasia when she concentrated her gaze on a person. Only this time it was considerably weaker. In any case, I stopped and looked in the direction of the warmth appeared to be coming from. An eleven-year-old girl winnowing rice at a distant table was looking at me and smiling. I went over and sat down beside her. Up close I could see her eyes sparkling with a fiery blue light and I began to feel an, eber, an even greater sensation of warmth. I asked her her name. Hello, she replied. My name is Nastya. So you have the ability to warm someone with your gaze, like Anastasia? Did you feel it? <clears throat> yes, I did. Little Nastia indeed had Anastasia's ability to warm a person's body with her gaze, although not to the same extent. Natalia Sergeyevna, the actress, came and sat down with us, and the cameraman began shooting. With no trace of embarrassment and without interrupting her work, Nastia started answering our questions. Where do you get your knowledge and abilities from? From the stars. What have you learned through your communication with Anastasia in Siberia? I've learned how very important it is to understand and love our motherland. Why is it so important? Because our motherland is what has been created by our forebears, both distant and close. Who are your parents? Where does your father work? My papa is a school teacher. It's nice in the school where he works, too, but here it's better. Here you are all living as a single, friendly, happy family. Have you forgotten about your parents? On the contrary, we love our parents more and more. We send them good thoughts so they can live well, too. The camera was running, and I, was, and I very much wanted Nastia to show the skeptics her warming gaze, and so I asked her, Nastia, now... You can show many people how to warm someone with your gaze. See the camera? Look straight into the lens and share your warmth with everyone who will see this. To warm everybody at once, that's really hard. I might not be able to do it. But I kept insisting. I repeated my request and exactly the same thing started happening with Nastia as happened with Anastasia back in the forest. When she tried to save her ray save with her ray at a distance a man and a woman from being tortured by bandits. I described this scene in my first book. Back then, Anastasia had initially expressed reservations. It's not within my power, she had said. Everything has been, so to speak, programmed in advance, but not by me. I cannot interfere directly. They have the upper hand right now. And yet, after my repeated request, she did what I asked her to do. She did it knowing full well that she might die in the process. And now, after my persistent pleading, little Nastia attempted to do my bidding. Twice in a row, without exhaling, she inhaled air, closed her eyes for a few moments, and then began to calmly look straight into the camera lens. The astonished cameraman fell silent. And then, all of a sudden, Natalia Sergeyevna tore off her kerchief and put it over Nastia's head. She was the first to notice how her body had begun to vibrate and her face had turned pale. I realized I should not have persisted with my request. There was no point in wasting energy on unbelievers. It would only intensify their anger and resistance. 
The grown-up visitors could not resist the impulse to touch the children. They touched them, hugged them, and patted them as though they were kittens. And why had I brought along a whole group of these grown-ups? After all, I was unaware. I was aware that this school receives visits from all sort of committee, sorts, sorts of committees and delegations, and even individuals come to have a look and to satisfy their curiosity and tune in to the grace and emanating from its inhabitants. And they do come and tune in and take away, but do not make any contributions of their own. And perhaps Anastasia was right when she said. In trying to, gra to gain the grace of a holy place, think what you might offer in return. And if you have not learned to emit light yourself, then why take it and bury it in yourself as though in a grave? I too had come to the school more out of curiosity than anything else. It was thanks to Anastasia that I had been so graciously received by academic Sh Shetnin, and the children had prepared a feast for me and my whole entourage. And it was far more than food that we took away from the table. The sparkle in the children's bright eyes gave us infinitely more. And what were we able to give them in return? A patronizing pat on the head? I was so angry with myself that I withdrew from the group and went off on my own to think. All of a sudden I became aware of the two girls who, whose acquaintance I had made, Lina and Nastia, standing at my side. Just relax, Nastia said quietly. Grown-ups are always that way. They want to pat our heads and give us a hug. They think hugging is the most important thing. And you've been on pins and needles the whole day. Come along with us to our glade, and we'll tell you about Anastasia. I know what space she is in right now. When we arrived at the glade, the cameraman who had joined us proposed, Let's get another interview with the girls. We'll get some excellent shots here. Look what a splendid landscape there is, and no one's around to bother us. Maybe not, I hesitated. We've probably tired them out already with so much questioning. But still, they'll be delighted to talk with you. They don't really like visitors and journalists coming around here. We've got a golden opportunity under our noses. It'd be a shame to let it slip by. Please understand my professional interest. I grabbed the microphone and told the girls, We have to do another interview with you. I'll be asking you some questions, and you answer them. Is that okay with you? If you need to, go ahead and ask, replied Lena, and Nastia added, Of course, of course, we'll be happy to answer. The girls took up a position right beside us and straightened their long brown braids. They looked at me straight in the eye, waiting for my first question. After two rather trite questions, I fell silent, suddenly realizing that these were the type of hackneyed, stereotyped questions they got from all the grown-up visitors committee members and journalists, whereas in fact they were capable of answering questions on themes most adults would never even have crossed their minds in their whole lifetime. A Cossack hetman was right when he said, My son's been studying here only three months, and I already feel there's a lot more I need to become aware of myself and quickly, or I'm going to look positively stupid next to him. In any case, aren't we taking, talking down to the children with our immature questions, inadvertently implying they're not capable of responding to anything more? I stood silently before these girls, holding the microphone in my hand, and saw in their faces how concerned they were for me. They realized I had lost my train of thought and didn't know what I should talk with them about. I admitted, ad I admitted as much to them. You know, I really don't know what to talk to you about, or even what questions I should be asking. And then ensued an utterly comic situation. Here we were, the cameraman and I, two stout grown-up fellows, and there in front of us were these two young girls, enthusiastically giving, e giving each other support, without a second's hesitation, explaining to us how to do an interview, how to make conversation with another human being. Just relax, they insisted. You've got to learn how to relax. The most important thing is to be sincere and talk about anything you're concerned about. Don't think about us. Of course you should think about any other person you're talking with, but you don't need to think about us if you find that too hard. Just relax. Just ask your questions from the heart. We'll be able to answer. Don't worry about us. As long as you're having trouble, let us tell you something ourselves. The girls were walking around the meadow, smiling, feeling the blades of grass and talking, the depth of their understanding of the universe, the purity emanating from their heart, their sparkling eyes with their eyes sparkling with kindness, literally immersed us in a sense of peace and confidence. 
The cameraman shot from a distance, not bothering to attempt switching camera angles. Later, I would spend hours watching and rewatching the videotape of Natalia Sergevna subsequently gave to me. I would be fascinated by these little charmers with their light brown braids walking through the glade. They will grow up. There are 300 of them at the school. I am writing about the school not to prove anything to anyone, but to gladden the hearts of those who have come to feel and understand Anastasia through my books. If anyone feels irritated by what I write and how I write it, they need not read my books at all. I have already had my, full of my fill of criticism over my writing style, my grammatical mistakes, and the suggestion of a commercial ulterior motive. In any case, I am still working on my next book. If you don't like my books, don't bother reading the next one. The events it describes are even more penetrating than the ones recorded in the volumes to date, and my style is getting better, but not by very much. Both the contents and the style could make you quite distraught.